Hello, Mr. Kaladi here, and today we are going to continue looking at multiple events and we're going to investigate conditional probability. We've already kind of alluded to this lesson. Let's revisit an example from our last lesson. The highest hand in poker is the five card royal flush, which is an ace, king, queen, jack, and ten of the same suit. So let's say you're one card away from the royal flush, you need one specific card. Uh, in this case, you need what? An ace of clubs. So you have a new deck, you have 52 cards in that deck. What's the probability you draw the ace of clubs? Well, there's one option out of 52, so there's a very low probability. Now, let's say you put that card back in the deck, and you draw a second card. What's the probability that you're going to get the ace of clubs now? Well, again, it's still one out of 52. We talked about this uh, in our last lesson. These are independent events. And this happens because you put the card back in the deck. So the probability of the deck goes back, it resets. Now, today we're going to look over here. What happens if you draw that card? Okay, you didn't draw an ace of clubs. So then you throw the card that you drew away, and you draw a second tar card. What's the probability that you get the ace of clubs this time? Well, again, there's still only one possible uh, winning card, but now there's only 51 options. So actually your probability has improved a bit. This is an example of dependent events. The probability of drawing the card the second time has changed based on what happened the first time. This is also known as conditional probability. If you think uh, about your um, you know, in French class you learn la conditionnelle, which is a verb tense all about hypotheticals. Uh, it's very similar. If something happens, something else happens. So if you draw one card and remove it, how does your probability change? That's a conditional probability. And that's what we'll be looking at in today's lesson. I'm just going to circle this. So this is today. Uh, our formal definition for uh, conditional probability, given two events, A and B, the conditional probability of A occurring given that B has occurred. is written A such that B or A given B. So this is how we're going to write conditional probability. And the way you pronounce this or the way you read it is A given B or A if B has occurred. As I told you just above, conditional probability is like the conditionnel. If something has happened, something else uh, follows. Now, once again, in this uh, lesson, I've tried to rewrite it so it includes some more relevant uh, real-world numbers. So in this example, we're going to be talking about drinking water. Uh, Canada is often lauded for having the very safe drinking water. But at any given time, there are hundreds of drinking water advisories issued by various government health organizations that tell people it is not safe to drink their tap water. So consider the province of Ontario with this population of 13 million. The population of people living in First Nations reserves is 58,000. As of March 1st, this last year, government organizations have issued water advisory that affect 22,000 people in Ontario. Uh, the number of people who, mu who are both living on a reserve and who must boil their water, who have water advisories, it's 19,000. So what I did is I looked at uh, the number, I looked at all the water advisories and how many people are infected, are, are affected. Then I also looked at how many people uh, are on First Nation reserves and how many of those people are affected by water advisories. So what is the probability that a randomly selected Ontario will not be able to drink their uh, tap water? First of all, let's Let's try to understand this a bit better by drawing a Venn diagram. So I'm talking about two things. The first thing is the number of people who live on a reserve. Well, let's say the, the first thing is the number of people who have a water advisory. Uh, 
Uh, and the number of people who have a water advisory is 22,442. But now I'm also talking about the people who live on a reserve. And that number is 58,100. But we have to consider some people are being counted twice here, right? There are uh, 19,000 people who are both living on a reserve and they have a water, boil water advisory. So technically the number in here is 19,368. So actually this number in here I have to subtract. And I have to subtract here too. So let me just get my calculator and write that. So I have 58100 minus 19. 368. So this is 38,732. And over here I have 22,442 minus 19,368. So that gives me 3,074. Okay, so number of people who have water advisory in Ontario, number of people who live on the reserve, and they're the people who have both. What is the probability that a randomly selected person in Ontario will not be able to drink their tap water? that is the probability of having a water advisory. Well this is an easy one. This is a probability like we've been doing for a while. There are 22,442 people who have a water advisory and the number of the total number of people in my entire set is 13 million. 448000. Zero, zero, zero. So I have 22442 divided by 13448000 and I get oof this very small number uh, it's a fraction it's like a times 10 to the negative 3 if I times it by 100 to make it a percent I get about 0.167% like it's a tiny percent less than 2% less than 0.2% which is great right Ontario has some of the cleanest water in the world now part B of those people who cannot drink their tap water, so of all the people who, uh, who have water advisories, this should say what? What is the probability that they also live on the First Nations Reserve? So think about what this is saying. Like of these people, what's, uh, how many of them are also living on a reserve? So it's essentially saying, well, oh, it's these people, right? It's this fraction. But the way this question is worded is a conditional probability question. The probability of living on the reserve given that you have a water advisory. That's the math lingo. The, or that's the way we kind of write it using this form, this uh, conditional probability format. But to figure out the answer, it's not that crazy. Like It's not that difficult. Of the 22,000 people who have water advisories, how many of them also live on a reserve? Well, it would be 19,368 live on a reserve, and there are 22,442 in total. So let me do the math on that. So it's 19,368 divided by 22,442, which is uh, 8.86, but then it times by 100 to make a percent. So it's approximately 86.3%. And now we see like what a staggering uh, issue this is. Like if you just think about again the social and, and, and just how we think of Canada. We have great, you know, water. Most people, you know, point two percent has water, bad water in Ontario. But if you zoom in on reserve, people living on reserve, well eighty six percent of people living in reserve uh, have water they can't drink. Like that's that's horrible. And that really shows this um, this, you know, the, we have a real fundamental problem in Ontario and Canada about providing water um, for First Nations communities. And this is something that I hope in in your our lifetime we can we can fix, right? Because I'm proud of our water system, but when I look at it uh, in this way, it's very it's sub something that is not something to be proud of. So this idea of uh, conditional probability, when you have a Venn diagram, it's not that difficult. You just are zooming in on this circle. Oh, you can't really see it like that. You're just zooming in on this circle and you're looking at the probability of uh, this part in terms of the whole circle. So 
you're really just zooming in to the water advisory population only. And what we can note, we note that the probability of being on the reserve given that you have a water advisory, well what did we actually do to find this number? Well we took the number of people in uh, the this intersection, so that is the reserve and the water population, the water advisory population, and we divided by the number of people in this circle, which is in the water population. And this follows then that you could write it with populi or probability as well. The probability of the reserve and water populations over the probability of water. So essentially what we've just discovered through this activity is the way of finding uh, conditional probability. The probability of A given B, remember that line means given, is the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. I'm just going to write, I always write off the side, order matters here. This formula, it matters if you have A first or B first. Remember when I read it, it's A given B. What's the probability of living on a reserve given that you have a water advisory? So make sure you're writing these questions in the right order. I'm just going to put this in the box because this is our conditional um, probability formula. If you rearrange it, so if I cross multiply, I end up with for independent events, P, the probability of A intersect B is the probability of A given B times the probability of B. So that's another formula and that's what I get if I rearrange. Compare this to independent events. The lesson we did yesterday. For independent events, you have A intersect B is equal to PA times PB. So it's a similar formula, it's just that here, probability of A and probability of B, you just multiply them. A does not depend on B. Whereas in the con this dependent events formula, you have the probability of A given B, right? The probability of A uh, if B has already happened. So you can see they're dependent, but you're still multiplying those formulas. I'll just show you our, uh, our formula sheet just to verify that this is in there and what it looks like for you. So there's our uh, formula sheet. So I have the probability, the addition rule, the addition rule for mutually exclusive events, conditional probability. So it's right there. And there is yesterday's formula, probability, independent events. So you don't have to memorize this, but you're going to get very used to writing it out. Okay, let's do another example. Oh, let's talk more about water quality in Canada. Okay, so we talked about water advisories. Now, when you go through water advisories, most of them are boil water advisories, meaning that you can drink the water, you just have to boil it for a little while to kill off any bacteria. Sometimes this is, this is necessary. Like if there's a bad storm in Vancouver, sometimes everyone in Vancouver has to boil their water for a few weeks. However, there are a few advisories that are do not consume advisories. This means the water is so polluted that you shouldn't even touch the water. You shouldn't even shower in it. Um, and some of these advisories have been active for over a decade. So I analyzed all the water advisories for Ontario. There are, again, this is actual numbers. There, there were 58 active water advisories when I analyzed them uh, last year. Of those 58, three were do not consume advisories, which means those the three of the places where you can't even let the water touch your skin. And of those 58, 17 have been ongoing for uh, for almost, what, seven years, since 2013 or earlier. 39 water advisories were not, were, are neither do not consume, nor from 2013 or earlier. Find the probability that, okay, then we have all these probabilities. 
So this question, if you want to think about it, there's two events we're looking at. Again, it's kind of a complicated question, but it's, it's a real world question, so this is like a trade-off, right? You're going to have to wrap your head around this, what, what I'm trying to talk about here. We have one event which is do not consume. Let's call it DNC. And we have another one which is event which is the water advisory is before 2013. That means that, I'm going to write it like this, less than 2013. Okay. One way of filling in a Venn diagram, if you remember I showed you a strategy in our first lesson for Venn diagrams, I'm going to label all of these with a letter. And then I'm going to take my numbers from this convoluted question and I'm going to assign them all to different variables. So let's start. Of the 58 active water advisories, okay, well 58 is the total. So that means A plus B plus C. But all of these added up has to be 58. Okay, what's my next one? 17. No, sorry, sorry. Three are do not consume, which means A plus B has to be three. 17 have been ongoing from 2013 or earlier. So 17 is equal to everything in this circle, B plus C. And finally, okay, 39. 39 are neither do not consume nor from 2000 or earlier, 2013 or earlier. So actually that's, that's just D. So now we need to solve could solve by inspection. I think the easiest way for to do this shouldn't take too long. I'm going to sub 1 and 4 into 1. No, sorry, 2 and 4. Sub 2 and 4 into equation 1. So that's going to give me 58. A plus B is equal to 3 plus C plus 39. That gives me 58 is equal to 42 plus C, so C has to equal, what, 16. I think that blows it open now. I can figure it out. Therefore, uh, B has to be 1. Therefore, A has to be 2. And D, we already know, is 39. So I have all my numbers now. So again, doesn't take too long to use that strategy to fill in the Venn diagram. 16, 1, 2, 39. Maybe you can do it without the this strategy, but I like it because it's very reliable. Okay, now we can find out a whole bunch of different probabilities. So, part A. Find the probability that a randomly selected water advisory is a do not consume. Well, the probability of a do not consume water advisory, that's, well, that's easy. That one's, there's three out of a total of 58. So very low probability that you're going to have a do not consume water advisory, which is good because that's, it's pretty bad. Uh, part B, what's the probability that a water advisory is do not consume and is from 2013 or earlier? So probability, if we can write this in probability language, do not consume and 2013. Well, I can use my, uh, oops, sorry, and is, is the intersection. Yes, yeah, sorry, I did that correctly. That's the uh, intersection, uh, so that's why I drew it as an intersection. So do not consume and before 2013. Okay, there's one out of 58. Can we just stop again and consider this? I mean, it's it's only one, but there's one area in Ontario, in our great province, where people haven't been able to touch the water from their taps since 2013, for seven years. Like, are we okay with this? Is that something that you want to live in? Like, we consider ourselves a developed nation, and there are people who, we you know, we haven't fixed this? This is, uh, a great, again, a great concern. Research this. Go figure out what is this place? Where is it? Why is it? And what's it like to live there? Okay, let's do question C. I fit this in here. Uh, what is the probability that a, a given water advisory is do not consume or it's from 2013 or earlier? So remember, or 
is like this. Probability of do not consume or 2013, this is a union. Uh, and union would mean I have to add all these numbers up. So 2 plus 1 plus 16 divided by 58. That gives me uh, 19 over 58. Uh, again, not great, right? That you have what almost a third of your uh, water advisories are either very serious or very long. Like that's not a great stat. Okay, part D. What's the probability that a, a water advisor is from 2013 or earlier, given that is do not consume? Oh well, we see this word given, and that's your spider sense should be going off. Hey, this is conditional probability. So you just have to make sure, this, this is my trick to do it, you have to write it in probability language, but make sure you write it in the correct order. So the thing that is given comes second. So really this question is asking you, what's the probability it's from 2013 or earlier? So it's 2013 or earlier. Then we write given that it's a do not consume. So make sure you interpret the language in the correct order. Now you just use your formula probability of 2013 and do not consume over the probability of do not consume of the second thing. Now you fill in the blanks. Uh, this intersection you already have. It's 1 over 58 divided by the probability of do not consume which is 3 over 58. This is really, if you get confused by f uh, fraction over fraction, you can write it like this uh, times the reciprocal. So I end up with 1 over 3. Uh, and let's do part E. The probability that is from a do not consume given that is from 2013 or earlier. So again, this question is asking what's the probability it's do not consume? What's the probability of do not consume given that it's before 2013? Oh, sorry. Probability that it's not a do not consume. So not a do not consume given that's 2013. Well, again, I just use my formula, probability of uh, not do not consume and 2013 over the probability of 2013. Okay, what's the probability that you're not in 2000, not in DNC and you're in 2013? Well, here's not, uh, not DNC. And there's the people that are all in 2013 and not in So there it is, 16 over 58. Divided by the probability of being in 2013, which was 17 over 58. So I end up with 16 over 17. So what you're going to find with uh, these conditional probabilities, they, they're just kind of an extension of what we've already done. The trick is to write the question, turn the, the words of the question into this probability language, make sure you're in the correct order, and then apply your formula. And you'll find that everything works out very nice. You sub in the values you need. The problem sometimes can be interpreting the language. But that keyword given, that's the one that's telling you, hey, you need to use the conditional, uh, the conditional probability. Okay, I wanted to show you one more question. And again, please, as you gain power and uh, influence in the world, uh, let's do something about Canada's drinking water, especially in First Nations uh, areas, because it's uh, something to be ashamed of. Okay, uh, now I wanted to do one more question, which is, uh, this is a very abstract question, which you sometimes see on IB tests, and, and you'll see in your homework as well. I'm giving you some probabilities, but there's no words to go with it. This is all just theoretical. So let's see if we can interpret what the question's asking. For part A, I need to find A intersect B. How am I going to find that? I can't draw a Venn diagram for these. Now, you have, however, learned a way to link probability of A, B, the union, and the intersection. If you don't remember, look, you have a formula right there. Combined events or mutually uh, non-mutually exclusive events, the addition rule. So let me use my addition rule. P union, uh, probability of A union B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the people who are counted twice, A intersect B. So now if I rearrange, I end up with P A U inter <laughs> intersect B is equal to P A plus P B minus the union. 
So I just re, uh, re uh, change, uh, flip these around, change the order around, and now I can sub in my values. So I have 2 over 5 plus 1 over 3 minus 1 half. Now, if only I could add these things, but it's probably you don't have a calculator, this is a paper one question, so you're going to use a common denominator. Uh, the common denominator I would use is probably 30, not 15, yeah, because it has to be even. So I'm going to multiply the 2 times 6 plus 1 times, what do I have to do, multiply it by 10, this one I have to multiply by 15. So I'm just going to make a little note there, we have a common denominator for adding fractions. You guys should be able to do this, right? This shouldn't be something new. So I end up with 12 plus 10 minus 15 over 30. That's 22 minus 15, which is 7 over 30. Great. Okay, let's do part B. What's the probability of B given A? Oh, this is an easy one, right? I can use that formula. B given A is equal to the probability of B intersect A over, and make sure you get this right, it's probability of the second thing, probability of A. Now, it just so happens the probability of the intersection I just found, 7 over 30, over probability of A, which is 2 over 5. Now, I think I've told you this already, but if you had an IB test, and you pretty sure you got the wrong answer here, doesn't matter if it makes sense, if it's a fraction, like it should be a fraction less than 1, Sub it in here because you'll still get your part, mar your, your follow through marks on part B, right? Even if you lose all your marks here, if you use the answer correctly here, you'll get full marks. So this becomes 7 over 30 divided by 2 over 5, so that's times 5 over 2. The 5, okay, goes into itself once, goes into the 6, so I end up with 7 over 12. Part C, what's the probability that of A given B? Well, running out of space here, I'm going to do it like this. Probability of A given B is A, A intersect B over probability of B. So once again, I'm going to write 7 over 30 divided by probability of B, which is 1 third, which is 7 over 30 times 3 over 1, which is 7 over 10. Okay, so tough question. Now, part D, are these events independent? What? I don't know. Sure, maybe. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Are we talking about water advisories? Are we talking about dice? It's unclear. So we have to mathematically find out a way in the abstract to determine if these are independent. If you forget, you can go back to yesterday's lesson or look at the formula sheet. For independent events, this has to be true. Probability of A times probability of B has to be probability of A intersect B. If this is not true, they're not independent. So, if A and B are independent, probability of A intersect B is equal to probability of A times probability of B. So let me check. Is this true? Let's look at the left side. Well, the left side here is probability of A intersect B. We found that to be 7 over 30. Let's look at the right side. Probability of A is 2 over 5 times probability of B is 1 over 3. That gives me 2 over 15. So, is this statement true? No, left side does not equal right side. Therefore, they're not independent. And this is the type of IB question you do have to be ready for. An abstract question that asks you to test independence. Remember I told you, to test if something is mutually exclusive, you have to use these two formulas. To test if something is independent, it has to satisfy this formula. So even though we don't like these questions, we'd rather do real life problems, uh, this is something we have to be comfortable doing. Okay, your homework for tonight is page 86, number 1 to 12. Good luck with that, and we'll see you next time.